You got it I all? Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Um, also, some upcoming events you might be interested in. The documentary Once Forgotten will be aired in a panel discussion afterwards on February 19th at 2 p.m. in the uh, Fitville Public Library Event Center. And on February 26th, our keynote speaker, Judy G. Russell, the legal genealogist, will speak on four topics from 9 to 3.30 her presentation from one to two will be about how the black laws of northern states created valuable records for tracing African American families. So, why research? Your ancestors are all a part of your background and have contributed not only to your physical appearance, but to your talents, abilities, spiritual thoughts, or faith, your basic philosophy of life has come down to you link by link through the ages. In researching your family history, you honor your ancestors, and it is a step towards a better understanding of yourself as well. It is an interesting and exciting hobby that can become a project for the whole family. And research has shown that children who know stories of their family are more resilient, have higher self-esteem, and feel they have more control over their lives. Searching Black American genealogy is essentially the same as any other group, though there are some differences that make it more challenging, but those challenges do not make the quest of history impossible. Where to begin the story of our lives? In beginning your research, most books and family history are collected, compiled, and published by private individuals who do so because they are interested descendants. In other words, family history is created by people just like you. Here are some tips for starting your research. We are basically going down the list in the handout here. What do you know? You want to start with yourself. I'll always start with self. You're the first twig on your family tree. You want to locate all of the vital information you can about your parents and then find out about your grandparents, great grandparents, and so on. At the basic level, Researching family tree should yield the following information for each person found. Date and place of birth, parents' names, date and location of marriage, names, birth dates of children, dates and place of death. These tools help identify family members in public records. Collect full names, remember to use maiden names of women, and then notice whether the public record indicates relationships to others. What can you do at home? At home, typically, uh, used to be more so uh, back in the day, but family Bibles were a huge place to find family records. Diaries, letters, baby books. Keep in mind that these are also good places to go when you hit a brick wall. Relatives and sources. Visit or visit or write your family who may have information. And um, you can also consider searching for distant relatives who may have already performed research by advertising in local genealogical bulletins or Facebook groups where your ancestors live. For most of the United States, record keeping became a requirement around the 1890s up to 1915. Before that time, birth and death records were found recorded among 
church records, family Bible, and possibly the newspaper. Marriages may be found in the county records often dating as early as the establishment of the county. However, in the early years, people were not required to record their marriages and many courthouses and court records were burned during the wars. How should I keep track? I mean, besides my two notebooks. We have various category charts to help keep track of your research. But our favorite here at the Public Library is this one. And in this one, you are the first generation. And when you start, when you start your research, you'll be at the top as shown there. Your parents are the second and your grandparents are the third. As you fill in your charts, the ancestors you have will double with each generation. And in 10 generations, you will have around 1,022 ancestors. You're going to want to take the information you have collected from your parents, family, here and there, that we have mentioned is going to help you guide your search. Keeping you on the right path and head to the federal census. And we have other, um, what do I want to say, other ways of uh, keeping your fam track of your family too. So if you want more of the family group forms, we have those also. We can talk about those. The federal census was started in some states as early as 1790. Yeah. And has been conducted every 10 years since and serves as a good source of genealogical information. Unfortunately, the Department of Commerce fire in 1921 destroyed most of the 1890 census. The latest census we have is the 1940. However, we are all anxiously awaiting for the 1950 as they release them every 72 years for privacy purposes. And so April of 2022, we, are, we should see a whole new set of records to pull information from. There are some difficulties with the census besides the loss of the 1890, um, 1890s. And Nancy will discuss more of these. But it is good to remember that the census records will list different amounts of information each year it was taken. It will list the people in the family and sometimes people not in the family. The approximate age and not always spell the spelled names as it is today. And you can, and you can see that in the, the census handout. Oops, sorry. Always keep in mind the times of which you are researching. Depending on how records are kept locally, there could be a range of terminology used that might be triggering. If, however, all possibilities are checked, every variation exhausted, you could very well find a valuable piece of your family history. Be accepting of facts, but also be understanding that you cannot confirm every fact. So, what is available at your library? Why are we not at the library in person doing this program? Well, well at the time of scheduling this event, we were not sure if we would be doing in-person programming. However, if you would like to get a full tour and understanding of what we have to offer, you can attend an introduction to genealogy class. We have them quite often, and I think our next one is March 26th. Or you can email or call us and schedule a 30-minute session with one of us, and we would be happy to give you a tour. For now, For now we would like to try and let you know virtually some of what we have waiting for you. Nancy will start with our online options that you can access at the library and from the comfort of your own home. Okay, hello, my name is Nancy. Now I know some of you have used online research before. Uh, we may be going over all of that if you haven't. But I'm here to help you navigate the three databases that you can access through our library's website. First, we will look at the African American Heritage, and then the 
Heritage Quest databases, which you can do from home. Both of those, if you've got a library card, you can do from home. Ancestry is now only available if you're in the library, but I will also walk you through an example family search that we've done on Ancestry. If you go to the library's main page, alib.org, and you click on the research tab, then you'll see genealogy word will come up. Click on genealogy. When you're on that genealogy page, you will scroll all the way down to the bottom, and that's where you will find the three programs we're going to work on. Now, first, we're going to click on African American Heritage. This database is wonderful. It's easy to use for research. The only tip that I have for this website is that you need to change the tab from exact under the names to Soundex. And this will allow you to find other names that are phonetically written or misspelled. Our next page that we're going to work on is the Heritage Quest. This is a genealogical page very similar to Ancestry because it's owned by Ancestry. You can still do this at home if you have your library card. You just need to put your card number and your PIN in. You'll have access. There are three areas that I want to point out on the Heritage Quest website. First at the top is the maps link. It's very helpful to get you oriented to see where your relatives lived. You've got to be aware that the counties were formed over a vast number of years and their boundaries changed. Some counties literally disappeared and some new ones came on. So always search in the counties adjacent to where your family lives, because you never know, they may have hopped over the county line to get married. The next item we need to have you look at is also at the top of the page, it's research aids. And when you click on this, it'll take you to a teaching web page. On the teaching web page, if you go down, you'll see, um, the African American research page down here on the bottom. And that is just meant to help you uh, understand what's available and how to go about some of the African American research you can do through their website. And the last third item from Heritage Quest is the Freedman Bank Records. And when you click on this link, you have access to the U.S. Freedman's Bank Records. Remember, I'd like you to change the word exact under any search you do to sound X similar. The Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, known as the Freedmen's Bureau, was established in 1865 to provide aid to free African Americans transitioning from slavery to freedom. It supported more than 4 million people. And the original purpose of the bank was to provide black soldiers during the Civil War the safe place to deposit their military pay. This collection contains records from between 1865 to 1874. They have a wealth of information because before uh, the war was over, many slave people did not have any legal rights. It's difficult to track them through census, marriage, and death records. So this may be the first time that you are able to find a family member by their name. Now the web, next site we're gonna look at is Ancestry. Everybody's heard about Ancestry. If you want to go on Ancestry here in library, you will come in, put your login and put your library card number and your PIN. And when you go to the first page of Ancestry, it will show you multiple places to search, but we're going to stick to the census part first. The federal census page uh, will help to fill in a lot about your ancestor. At this point in time, 1940 is the most recent census that you will see. But come in the spring, I believe about April, the 1950 census is coming out, and we'll get all sorts of new questions and answers for that. So 
questions. Now, I'm going to take you through an example search of an African American family that I recently did. This was um, pretty typical. Uh, the patron knew her granddad's name was James Foster. She knew he was born about 100 in Louisville, Arkansas. She knew that he had lived for a time in Tulsa, and that's where he married her grandmother, Rowena Embry. He had died about 1980 in Los Angeles. Now keep your search terms close or similar to your ancestors vitals, but don't put them exact because then you'll lose a lot of search results. The search results we get for James shows eight hits. The next, next search. Um, I'm not going to go down here and count the very bottom one, which is family tree uh, member research works because for those could give you a lot of inaccurate information. Please try to keep to official documents or primary documents as much as possible. If you hit a brick wall and you have no other choice, then you can go to family search pages or family tree pages, but only accept and take anybody else's work into your family tree if they show a primary source. So for this result, show that there's three hits for a James Foster in 1940. We show one hit for 1930. That matches our James. Out of those three hits for 1940, only one of those matches the parameters that our patron had for her James. The marriages are good accurate hits, both of them for our James. The Social Security Index hit is not our James because our James did not die in Tulsa. He died in Los Angeles. And the World War II registration card matches the place our patron claims her James was born. Now, one of the marriages that James had was after the 1930 census. So James married Flossie on August 10th, 1931. And the next marriage shows James marrying the woman our patron knew as her grandmother, Rowena Embry. James married Rowena after the 1940 census on May 4th, 1943. And this will tell us to expect Flossie on the 1940 census. because. Rowena didn't show up till 1943. Read these marriage records thoroughly. You will find the church that they may have attended. You may also find a pastor or witnesses at the church, which may give you clues to other relations. Our next slide is going to be for military. And on this James World War II registration card, we get our first clue that's his full birth date, which we desperately need. His full birth date is October 25th, 1950. Or excuse me. It was 1900. And we see that he was born in Louisville, Arkansas. Now, one thing you need to do is you need to find the county that Louisville, Arkansas is turns out to be Lafayette County. And it, James gives his address in Tulsa to tell them, tells you who he works for and the person who will always know where to find him. So that would probably be some sort of relation. On our next slide, we will show 1940 census. And we always will start with the most recent census and go backwards. And due to layout needs, I'm not going to show you the full actual original form of this particular 1940 and 1930 census. But regardless, every time you get a result, you need to look at the original form. This isn't uh, just a sort of an index showing what was on that form. So the 1940 census shows James living with his wife, Frances. Now we're going to have to assume that Flossie, the woman he married in his marriage record, 
is a nickname for Francis. He also has a son named Willie, who's age 17. Living with him is Bernice Brown and Willie Brown, whom he lists as niece and nephew. He has a son-in-law, William Ander Henderson, also living with him. James is renting his home and his occupation is cook. When we compare that to the 1930 census next to it, which was before James married Flossie, we show he was originally married to an Addie M. And we know that this is our James because with him, living with him in the correct age, is his son Willie, who's seven at the time. James is renting his home on Marshall Street and he works as a porter at a hotel. I was unable to find James Foster on the 1927. He would have been about 20 years of age and he probably would have been out on his own for the first time. So he could have been living anywhere in the United States. But no worries, we're going to redo the search and put in different parameters. And instead of Tulsa, which we got the first results from, we're going to put in Lafayette County, Arkansas, which is where he said he was born. And we're going to show what we find there. We find a delayed birth certificate. With James Foster, he was born approximately 1950, or excuse me, 1900 in Lafayette County, and we find his delayed birth certificate. The Social Security, when it was established, required individuals to provide proof of birth. Passport applications also required a proof of birth. And if an individual was born prior to 1914 or the surrounding years when birth certificates were not standard, then they needed to apply for a delayed birth certificate. When they did that, they usually made the application and then they had somebody who was a witness to their birth to sign an affidavit saying, yes, I know this person, I know this person was born on this date. So on his delayed certificate, we see that his father was written down as William. His mother is Amy Jamison. And according to his sister Lizzie, who is the witness giving the information about his birth date, Lizzie is 56. She's listed as his sister. She shows that James was born on October 25th, 1900. This matches the military record we originally had. So this is our James. James's family lived in Lafayette County, Arkansas, and both his parents were stated to be born in Arkansas. So now we have James, we have lots of information about his background, and we have his parents' names. So we can do a search for James through his parents. Here's James' results in Arkansas. In Lafayette County, there are four results. The first two results, when I looked at them, did not match our James because he was the son of an Archie Foster. And our, we're looking for a James who is the son of William. But I'm going to keep this in my files if I were looking for him because he's in the same county, he's got the exact same name. So I'm wondering if he could be a relation of James, could be a cousin who was named the same thing. The next two searches are definitely our James. They are for 1900 and 1910 in Lafayette County, Arkansas, and they do fit our search parameters because they have a William name, a father named William, and a mother named Amy. Okay. On the 1910 census, we're working backwards, we show that they lived in Steel, Steel Lafayette County, Arkansas, and notice that his name is now listed as Jim. So remember to look for nicknames. He's age 10, he's living with his parents, William and Amy. But here it says it's Annie. If you enlarge a census, this census, you could almost say that Amy could be Annie. This is one of those chances when, uh, or instances when it could be either a mishearing or so it's phonetically similar or just bad writing on the census taker's part. You'll see his father is born in Arkansas, just as we expected that this 
Sister Lizzie had wrote on his delayed birth certificate. And on her delayed birth certificate, we see that his mother here was born in Texas, whereas his sister said mother was born in Lafayette. But because Lafayette County is a bordering county to Texas, this is close enough to say, yes, this is our James. We see his siblings are Henry and Lizzie, who was the one who signed his delayed birth certificate, Alex, George, Butler, Willie, and Roberta. And a bonus from reading this whole page, which you should do, in fact, you should read not just this page, but the prior page and the page after any census, is that we see the name Brown living next door. And remember on James's 1940 census, he had Brown relations. When we go to the 1900 census, it's also in LaGrange Township. It confirms that this is our James because of the matching family numbers. Now, James is an infant in June of 1900. That was the date the census was taken. Here it's written he's only three months old. That would give him a birth date of February in 1900, which is not correct. But we know he was born three months earlier in October, but when a census taker comes and looks at a baby, he may see a, what is a six month old baby and mistake it for a three month old baby. So that could be an error on the census taker's part. Sometimes that's Ancestry will highlight the wrong family when you do a search. But don't worry about that because our Jim family are right above this highlight. Mom is called Emmy, yet another version that's similar to Amy. And it's phonetically close to Amy, so I'm going to accept that this is definitely James. Now we're going to jump back a generation. We're going to leave James. He won't be born on the next census. We're going further back in time. But we know his father. We know his father was William. And we show on the 1880 census that William was born in Arkansas, give or take, around 1860. A few years, we can go up four or five years. So by getting William being born in 1860, this tells us that William was probably born into slavery and he was born in Arkansas, so he's probably born in Lafayette County. We do get an 1880 census hit when we search for William. And as there are no other William hits when we do a search that are even remotely close to 1860 living in Lafayette County, we believe that this is our James's father, William. William is 15 living with his parents, Joseph, born 1825 in Mississippi, and Fanny, born in 1843 in North Carolina. So here we are, we've got James, one generation. William, second generation. Now we've got F. David that proved that third generation was Joseph and Fanny. We see Joseph and Fanny with other children. They have Mary, who is 16, Lily, 12, Margaret, 10, Lorena, 8, Elle, just 7, Wilson, 3, and Ellen, 11 months. So now we have pre-emancipation pre date and places for all these foster family members. And if you read the next family next door, there is an M foster, age 45, born in Mississippi, just like Joseph and Polly, age 70, born in Virginia. It seems likely that this could be Joe, brother, and his mother. And a Brown living with yeah. him. Excuse me? And a Brown living with him, too. Yes. Yeah. yes. So now we've gone back from James to William to Joe to Polly. And that is quite a few generations. So that would be James's great grandmother. And I want you to remember and keep in mind the locations where all these people were born because it's going to tie in with another search we're going to do. Okay, in 1870, we're still in LaGrange, Lafayette County.
We find William with his parents, Joseph and Fanny. Now, William has siblings are Mary, Lily, and Margaret. And this confirms we're on the right track because everything matches with our 1880 William. William is listed as being born in 1858 and he's age 12. Now there's kind of a discrepancy there. How can somebody who 10 years, 10 years from now in 1880 be 15 if he was 18 or 12 in 1870? And I believe the 1870 age is more correct than the 1880 because it shows William only gaining three years in that 10 year span, but it shows his siblings all gaining 10 years as they should. So I believe the 1858 birth year for William is more correct than the other one we showed, the 1865. So really, probably William was 22 in 1880 instead of 15. There is a Henry Steed living with them. No relationship is stated on this form. He's listed as a farm laborer. Um, this is 1870, the first census after emancipation. So he could be either a fellow slave who was newly emancipated and simply living with them and helping them work their farm, or he may be related. We'd have to keep his name in mind and do some further, further research on him. Okay, now here's the hard leap back into uh, pre-emancipation times. We're going to go to 1860. A step over this obstacle that all Black Americans have, unfortunately, is that only in 1860 have written as female, male, and their ages. There's no names. So to overcome this, I looked for anybody else in that county with the name Foster. Um, I was able to find some that were relations to him, but in order to find out where they were really on a census in 1860, I had to go to a white family who was named Foster and look at all their census deeds and wills. And doing the preliminary search of the Foster name in Lafayette County, from 1837 to 1860, only one white Foster family stood out. There was a George Williamson Foster and his wife, Mary, who were born in Virginia. Remember that Holly, James's great grandmother, was born in Virginia. George's two sons were Benjamin H. and Patrick H., both born in Tennessee. They own land in Hempstead County, Arkansas, and Lafayette County, Arkansas, which was a county cut off of Hempstead. Hempstead originally took up all this area of land in southwest Arkansas, but then they split it. It became Hempstead and Lafayette. And when we look at these families' names for the 1860 census, and we have to look at their slave schedules, I found more than five different slave schedules for all these various foster, white foster family members. Out of those, only two fit our Black American foster family. And those were the farms that had been owned by Patrick H. Foster, the son of the original George. On one farm schedule, there was a man whose age matched Joseph. I don't have it up here, but on another slave schedule, we find slave schedule, which pretty well matches William and Fanny. In 1870, Fanny was 29. He, so she would be 19 in 1860. And I indeed do find a female who's 19 in 1860. And right close beside her, William, who was 12 in 1870, I find a young boy who was age two. I can't say for certain that this is William and Fanny, but I have a very strong gut feeling that this is them. The location of these farms was near LaGrange where they all had lived in the other censuses. And we, I went far back 
1850 and the 1840s census schedules for this foster family, and they all have ages matching Joseph, Fanny, and possibly William. While doing this background search of the foster families, both white and black, in Lafayette County, I found really early on in 1837, all the way up to 1860, many, many land deals for this Patrick and his father George and his brother Benjamin. In fact, there was 144 results, or 143. 143 land results where they came in and they bought 30 acres here, 40 acres here, 80 acres here. So they were the primary 144 times they bought land in Lafayette County. They uh, That shows that they owned a big chunk of this land very early on when Arkansas was barely a state. Now for our generic research difficulties, there we go. Some of our common obstacles are going to be sometimes the census taker used initials. Sometimes he used a middle name. Sometimes he used an alternate name, a nickname. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you don't find any result. And that's really scary when you don't find any result. But don't worry. We find other resources to fill that in. Some census years will be simply missing, and some of them have phonetic spelling incorrect. Okay, go back to solutions. The solutions to finding the correct information is don't be too precise, don't put exact, even though if your name's Smith, don't put Smith, put similar to Smith or sound extra Smith. The Smith can be spelled many, many ways. You wouldn't believe how many ways. If you get stuck, you can use neighbors or relations or people that you thought lived close to them. Be sure to always search the page prior, the whole page that your ancestor is on, and the page after. And for if you don't find them at all, or for instance, the 1890 census, which was burned at the National Archives, don't get upset about that. We can still look under military, wills, land records, city directory, and other items that can help you fill that 20 year gap. Thank you, Nancy. And so when in the library, the Grace Keith genealogy collection, it's a little different. As for hitting the books, Grace Keith genealogy department does things a little differently. When Miss Keith was putting together our first genealogy department in 1977, she was thinking of people who were just beginning their search, new to the library possibly, and perhaps not sure how to navigate either. Keeping those things in mind and trying to make it as friendly use as possible, she developed a color-coded guide that we still use today. And it's also important to mention that there are two kinds of sources. You have your primary source, which is the document itself, and a secondary source, which is the copy of that document. And we always try to get as close to primary sources as possible, um, but you know we use what we can get. Having said that, we'll continue with some of the resources you will want to check at your library. Get started in our new sections. We are excited to offer some of the areas in our collection beginning in 2021. Because of the difficulties mentioned, we are continually trying to make the patrons search as easy as possible. Here we have some guidebooks on the beginning, on beginning your genealogy. And here we are working on a collection of the slave narratives the WPA collected in, I think started 1929 about, but so it's 1936 to 1938. Although I found a lot of these on the accessgenealogy.com website and the University of Arkansas have Arkansas specific in their online catalog. Some accessible without a card, but most is not. 
We'll soon, be, soon have other sections among our native area for the freedmen and the black natives. When looking in the native section, or any section really, make sure you look at all areas, but definitely look in the dark blue and yellow, light blue, and light green areas. You rarely see the light green dot there, but. Dark blue is uh, census mortality and taxes. And all of these are just ways to count people. Sometimes people get missed in the indexing of the census records online. So it's always a good idea to double check the books. The yellow um, deeds and a light blue wills and probates, records of, pro of property acquisition and disposition can be useful sources of genealogical data. Such records are normally located in county courthouses. Often, the earliest county records or copies of them are also available in state archives. We at least have an index of most of the county courthouse records and microfilm of some of those on hand here. In the yellow deed book, uh, the yellow dotted ebooks. You can see here under items transferred, um, you're lucky enough to at least get a first name, which is is always fantastic. Um, a full name, obviously better. Let's see. Here under a will book, you're like lucky enough to see that, um, and that's the light blue. It's also guardianship and probate. But under this one in Kent County, Maryland. It actually lists two full names, at least, which is a huge find. Directories and phone books. Also, we have under uh, the yellow dot. And they have lots of information as well. If you're having a problem figuring out how a book works, there are oftentimes guides or instructions in the front. And this one here lets us know all the abbreviation guys. And I like that the oldest directory here listed a bit about the area and who the spouse was, if a person was widowed, their occupation, and sort of where they lived. It's, I like how it says resident center near Oak. Dark green is cemeteries and obituaries, and unfortunately, cemetery records are a lot like other records, few and far between. The cemeteries so far that we know of, Boone Cemetery listed of two people, Baldwin Cemetery with seven, and Oak Cemetery, also known as Twin Oaks, 265. And the, the Oak Cemetery has just recently been on Listed on was it Nancy's uh, National Archive? Yes, National yeah. Historical Sites. Historical Sites. And so um, a lot more attention has been taken care of that one, thus being able to find 265 people, which is fantastic. And there's possibly more to come. As in my research, I saw that East Mountain Cemetery, or otherwise known as the Wade Family Cemetery, is being restored as of 2014. We do have an obituary database available in the library. However, we are working diligently to upgrade it and have it accessible to the public again soon from the comfort of their own home. And hot pink, we've got the Bible records, births, and churches. And investigate the possibility of finding genealogical data in the records of the church to which an ancestor, your ancestor might belong. And again, she saw that on the death certificate. So it's um, sometimes able to be found. There are three churches that were in this area, Restoration Church, St. James Baptist Church, and St. James Methodist Church. The former is the only one that we have any information on as of now. And um, with that, she was talking about the birth records. And what we have here are the prior birth indexes. 
Uh, the need to free uh, were, were a United States citizen to get a job on pensions came before the state actually required to keep records of births. The delayed birth records or the prior birth indexes are, are where one can find some of records before birth certificates. The light green are histories, genealogical society journals, orderlies. Um, the journals and quarterlies in general are a wealth of information. We have a few of the AMHGS journals and have been trying to purchase items from the Arkansas chapter recently. Our vertical files are also a wealth of information. However, journals, quarterlies, and our vertical files, resources take time and end up researching. And then that equals time. Uh, white would be the new, uh, newspapers. Uh, please keep in mind the years you are researching when accessing indexes. We have a good selection of the Arkansas Gazette indexes, but again, the race terminology for the times you are searching will be different and different than currently used. Over here, you see the half dots. In the bright orange. Currently, we've changed those to light pink, and all of that means is that a book has been indexed separately, and it's there with the index. Um, the Arkansas Gazette again is the place to look for information, and we do have uh, the Black Arkansas newspaper uh, checklist. This is good in a way because once you have a name, you have another avenue. So if you can find a paper that was published in the area where the ancestors lived, um, it's, it's another good avenue to go down. Uh, we keep all our military books together by war. So if you have an idea of when they may have served, we can try to help you find them. Also, if you have lost a person all of a sudden, you want to look for them and see if there may have been a war during that time, and then check the registers. There are many libraries and genealogical societies will do limited research for a fee. Our support is $15 an hour. We do way more than that. Sometimes they might have a list of people in the area who do research. I will tell you that uh, the random access genealogical finest, where we'll do a limited amount of research for free. And you can see that on one of your handouts, but it's uh, R-A-O-G-K dot org. Even though places like Washington County Historical Society do not do research themselves, don't count them out. They produce a wealth of resources to help researchers. The WCHS has an annotated bibliography on black settlers in Washington County, Arkansas, for those who want to study the African-American pioneers of the county. You can also there's the offer of hiring a researcher, um, also on one of your handouts. You can go through the Board of Certi Certification of Genealogists, and they usually list quite a few that would do research. Where else? Well, I'll let Nancy handle that one. You should have gotten with the letter I sent you by email, a set of five handouts. And on one of those handouts is our favorite websites for Black American genealogical resources. There's lots of good on there. I can't name them all, but some of the highlights are Find a Grave, the B. Friedman's Bureau Project, there is a podcast from the Library of Congress Folk Life Center. There is blackpast.org, which has easily searchable links. There's Cindy's List, which is a comprehensive list of links. And Linkopendium, which is kind of location-centered research links. So if you know the county your ancestor lived in, that would be a good place to start. So we are here for you. And we thank you for taking the time to come and listen to us. Does anybody have any questions?
hello, this is Julia Sampson. Thank you so much for your information here. It's a lot to uh, take in here and my, my, yes, brain, <laughs> my brain is swimming. I'm just swimming right now. But just you take it a step, a step at a time. <laughs> He'll be okay. It, it, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I need to hear that. <laughs> but you mentioned a, an email with links. I, I, I'm i not seeing that. Did you not get an email from me yesterday? And there were attachments to it, which had handouts. Oh, oh, so oh, oh, oh my God. Have gone to a J.R. Sampson. No sooner than I said it. And here it is. I am so sorry. <laughs> and just open each of those attachments. Yeah. And you will have the handouts that we have um, that will help you out. You can print those off if you have a printer. Yes. But that'll give you a lot of information that we went over today. So don't get scared that we've thrown verbally all this information at you. Um, the handouts kind of are a good starting point to help you remember. Anybody else have a question? And again, we're we're always here, and you can always email us. You come in and set up a time for us to just um, spend time with you and help you get started. 